Good to go. Okay. Joe. Num. What are we on? Is this episode four? Numero cuatro. Episode four. Start of the Camino. Yes, yes. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get out them giggles. It's like Bob Ross. <laughs> We're going to paint this happy little tree, and he's going to have a friend that's a happy little bush. <laughs> okay, let's get serious. Talk Camino. Hi guys, welcome to the Beans Talk Podcast, where we talk about everything travel. Sharing first-hand travel advice and getting to the bottom of real-life experiences in the hopes to inspire you to get out there yourself. Alright, so if you haven't noticed already, we're slightly obsessed with this thing called the Camino de Santiago pilgrimage that goes all over Europe. It always ends in the same place, so... Yeah. All trails lead to Santiago de Compostela. Which is northwest Spain. Yep, and it's uh, believed to be the resting place of the remains of St. James, which is the reason why people walk this way, is because of his teachings through uh, Christianity and... I said that way, Christianity. Um... <laughs> Uh, so, <laughs> I swear I know what it's about. I just don't know how to say it. Um, no, so it's, uh, he was a martyr. He, he died for his beliefs, um, which were the teachings of Jesus Christ. And it used to be, I think, very, uh, rooted in Christianity. And that's why it became a pilgrimage was to, uh, walk to Santiago to pay homage. Yeah, and um, I believe I believe that uh, now it's it's not as religious as it once was, but it is still very much so um, about. It is for some people. Yeah, totally. Um, but it is. I think it's evolving in a sense that people walk it for many reasons. Many so. different reasons. So, but it's. I think it is an inward journey that we all kind of have in common to really learn about ourselves and what we're capable of. So, it was something that we had read about in what, like National Geographic. Maybe? Mm -hmm. There was a quick article in National Geographic was the first place I had read about it. And then you showed that to me, mm -hmm. and we thought, oh, that'd be really cool to do a, a long walk in Europe. And I thought it sounded amazing. Yeah. My mom had showed me it in the magazine, and then it told me that my uncle had some friends that had walked it and said it was just incredible. Yeah. So there was um, a bit of a story there as well as the article, and that was my first introduction to what the Camino was all about. And I think that once um, we had heard that they had made a movie about it, um, it's a movie called The Way, and it was made by uh, Emilio Estevez and his dad, uh, Martin Sheen. And so we had seen that movie, and I think immediately after watching it, we were like, okay, yeah, it's done. We're going to start our year and a half long trip with this awesome walk. But where our story left off was that we had just gotten to St. John Pied de Port, which is a small little mountain village at the start of the French way of the Camino de Santiago. Which is, was it 12 kilometers from the Spanish border? Yeah. So just, yeah, very close, basically on the border. Mm -hmm. Very pretty area. Rolling mountains, green hills, cattle. It's a quaint little village. There's a river that runs through it. Yeah. And it's very green. Tucked in the Pyrenees. Very dreamy. Yes, it's almost Shire like. Yeah. <laughs> I can I'd agree with that. And we kinda just went to well, it was almost like the first albergue that we saw. And did we book it ahead of time? 
No. Okay. No, we just walked up and the guy was really nice and said it was 20 euro a night, which didn't seem too crazy to us at that point, especially with what we just went through with trying to find accommodation in Bordeaux and that was kind of a hellish situation. So we were like, sure, yeah, we want a bed for the night. And we were just glad that he had a bed. <laughs> yeah. Considering what we had just gone through. Yeah. So, but it was, they were really nice rooms, super clean and new. And I think there were only two bunks to a room. So. Yeah. Bunk bed. Yeah. And there was actually, we were the only two people that ended up sleeping in that room. There was nobody else with us. So. There was breakfast too. And yeah. He had orange juice and eggs and bread and meat, I think. And it was a pretty nice spread. Good breakfast. So we had planned on having the rest of the evening there in St. John that night, and as well as the next full day with departing or starting the Camino the following morning. So we had about a day and a half of uh, kind of gearing up for the Camino, as well as um, just checking out St. John for what it was. Yeah. Which was awesome, and I recommend spending a day there just because it's so nice and quaint. And there's cool little shops, and it's just a very peaceful little village. Yeah, like a couple little cafes you can go to, and there's the bridge that goes right over the river there, and nice little walks just along the river. They have a nice church, and um, there's a really cool... Uh, like a castle or fort or something? Oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot about that. You can hike up to a little fortress on top of a hill there, and it gives you a really good surrounding uh, view of all the all of St. John and around it. All the mountainsides, <laughs> it's, yeah. Yeah, it's Very really picturesque. Really picturesque and nice. And so, yeah, we just kind of explored that day, and we're just gearing up to start that long pilgrimage <laughs> and yeah I think that the Camino itself is roughly around well when you're walking from St. John uh, I think they say it's close to 900 kilometers which is around 550 miles so that's about how long that would be including the walk to the coast there's a lot of forks in the road and um, you know take path a b or c so generally it's you know a little different depending on which route or you know forks you end up taking along the way but generally that's roughly the distance yeah and i think that with um everybody who uh walks it when they're trying to get away from work or they don't have you know a lot of time they'll try to squeeze it in within a little over a month. I think 35 days was kind of like what we were hearing on average of people who did have the time limit or time constraint. That's how fast they wanted to walk it. For us, we were pretty open with our our Schedule. time. Yeah, our schedules. We had so, all the time in the world. So we really didn't want to rush it and we left ourselves, you know, the flexibility to decide where we wanted to stop and rest for like a day or just kind of listen to our bodies and when we needed time we gave which it is ourselves. really the way it should be done it shouldn't yeah you shouldn't try to cram in a camino it's really you go at your own pace and at your leisure yeah and that's really what the camino is about you know versus trying to just rush from beginning just to get to the end uh, you'd hear a lot that it's, you know, it's about the journey, not the end destination. Probably one of the number one, not complaint, but more so, I guess, somewhat of a regret that people said that they had about walking the Camino was that they didn't allow themselves enough time to yeah. walk. That but, they gave themselves too little time to where they were rushed and yeah, what we just explained. Yeah. yeah, so for us, we felt like we had oodles of time. Which and perfect. Which was perfect, and we <laughs> completed it in 43 days. So yeah. if you're planning to walk the French way and you want to give yourself enough time to maybe stay a night in one of the bigger cities and explore, 
Uh, yeah, I would say roughly around. Or if you need a rest day, if something happens, yeah, if you, you get know. super bad blisters, or if your knees blow out, or yeah. whatever. Yeah. If you meet someone and they if, and they want to, you know, stay somewhere an extra day, and you want to keep walking with them, but you have to keep going, then it's, you know, you're just always going to be right behind them, and so it's nice to give yourself ample time. Yeah. So if if I could suggest anything to somebody looking into walking the French way is definitely give yourself enough time. To yeah, that was definitely the biggest complaint was, so. yeah, people were saying they didn't give themselves enough time. And you risk injury, too, when you, when yeah, you rush yourself. Yeah, if you're pushing yourself that hard. Yeah. But, yeah, so St. John was awesome. I loved that little town. I loved staying there and exploring for an extra day. And I remember we had walked into a little chocolate shop and... We could not speak or communicate with the woman there, and we just wanted to make sure that none of the chocolates had walnuts in it, because Carl's extremely allergic, and so uh, I don't know how we communicated it, but we ended up finding one that didn't, and we enjoyed those right by the river. And I think they had, like, bags of nuts inside. Oh, yeah, that's right. And I think I pointed to the bag of walnuts and then pointed to the chocolate. It's very much a game of charades when you're trying to communicate. But yeah, so I I loved that we had an extra day there. And yeah. We ended up going to a shop and like buying the little walking sticks that mm-hmm. were, uh, you'd always see the pilgrims with the walking sticks. and Click, click, yeah. yeah. <laughs> click clacking along. Yeah. And some people choose to... Uh, use the collapsible ones, you know, with the trekking poles. Yeah, like trekking poles, and we we didn't uh, bring those with us, so we just chose the the wooden walking sticks. And I think we just kind of chilled and uh, just kind of soaked in the atmosphere of this of, cool little chill yeah. village. Yeah, and you could really feel the excitement kind of in the air that everybody who was there was about to embark on the same, you know, walk and. And they were all pretty excited, some pretty nervous, you know, not knowing what to expect. I remember being pretty nervous just because, I mean, when we were walking in Bordeaux, my back was hurting me pretty bad, so I didn't know if I was capable of doing it physically. But, um, yeah, but everybody's, you know, there for the same reason. and was, Different reasons. but Well, I mean. The same get, goal. <laughs> the same goal, to get to uh, Santiago, so. Yeah, we also had picked up our scallop shells as well. Oh, yeah, that's Which right. is a symbol of a pilgrim mm-hmm. walking the Camino is a scallop shell. Yeah. So everyone's got them on their packs on the back. Yeah. And those are also the markers along the way, too. In the different cities or villages, you see the yellow scallop shell. And that's what you follow. Also with the yellow arrows. Yeah, so I think that um, we did check in at the Pilgrim's office, which was on kind of a steeper slope um, in the town, but you just kind of walk up the cobblestone streets up this little hill, and it's on the left-hand side, and you go in there, and, you know, there's people who speak all different languages willing to welcome the Pilgrims and kind of check them in, and if you don't have your credential, which is your passport, which is what you get stamped at every albergue that you stay at along the way, or just every little cafe, wherever you choose to get a little stamp uh, the whole way, that's where they'll give you that passport. And they'll give you a layout of, you know, the elevation changes or... Basically a lot of general info, or like all the info you need, really, if you're, depending on how prepared you were or thought you were, they kind of uh, make sure that you're off for an informative start. Yeah, definitely. It's really cool, though, that they're all there uh, helping pilgrims out. Yeah. Um, I know that when we booked the room for the second night, because we had found out that there were other albergues that uh, were cheaper, or I think there were even one or two that were donativo, which means free, or donation, so you can just... You usually want to give something. Yeah, of course. 
Mm. So there, um, there was those choices. We just picked one that was, I think, around 10 euro. Yeah. So half the cost of the one we stayed in the night before. Um, we were checked in by a nice older lady and she just kind of told us, you know, breakfast is at this time and, you know, here's the room, here are the showers, gave us the little lowdown. The rooms were a lot bigger than the room we were in the night before. There were like eight bunk beds, I think. So yeah, six, I think there were 16 people. 16 people in the one room. Or at least room for that many. Yeah, and I, uh... Remember, we were just kind of laying low that day. We had done a little bit of walking around town, but I think we were just sitting, kind of gearing ourselves up and preparing for the next day's walk. And I remember at one point there was a pilgrim who had laid down for a nap and just starts snoring up a storm. And I remember catching the eyes of another guy in the room, and he just looked over and was like, ah, oh, shit. <laughs> And I was like, yeah, damn it. Because <laughs> we, you know, you don't really want to get caught in a room with a really loud snore because you, you want the best sleep you can get possible. But it happens. You have no control over it. It's part of the experience. So that's, yeah, that's, yeah. You never know if you're going to expect that, but you think about that every night. <laughs> Depending, and some, you, you know, sometimes you'll learn who is the bad snorer, and hopefully you won't end up booking the next night with him as well. Yeah, I just didn't have any choice <laughs> with you. <laughs> I, I don't either. I kid. Um, but yeah, so we were hanging in that night, and I remember we went to bed pretty early. Uh, maybe around, I want to say like 9 or 9.30. Between 9 and 10. Yeah. Basically when it gets dark. Yeah, which is pretty early for us. <laughs> we normally are up until like midnight or something. At least we had been too, especially yeah. with yeah being out at night. But we were pretty exhausted from our Bordeaux experience. It wasn't too bad to That's true. get to bed early. Yeah, so we are you know, trying to fall asleep. I don't think I slept all that much because the guy above me was kind of a squirmer. So he was rattling the bunk a little bit. And I think that it was around 6 in the morning that, or maybe earlier than that, that people started rustling around in their packs. And so you hear stuff and you kind of get up and you're like, what? why are you making so much noise? You know, like, try to be quiet. <laughs> Pilgrim life starts early. Yeah, it does. And I know that 6 o'clock, like, on the dot, the lights fl flashed on in the room, and we were like, what the hell? Why? But everybody wanted to get up and wanted everybody up, so I don't know. Usually that's not the case, and people are a little bit more considerate, but at that moment, I think everybody's just like, whatever, we're at the start, let's go, you know? So everybody seemed in quite the hurry to get up, eat something, and get out. I think everyone knew what kind of day was ahead as well. and Yeah. That they wanted to kind of get a jump on the day as early as possible, just because the first day is one of the hardest days. Yeah, if not the most difficult, uh, technically. <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, so we get up and we go into the kitchen and... I remember it being pretty uh, pretty chaotic in there. <laughs> there were a lot of people, like most people were leaving by the time we got in there. We were a little slow to rise, but um, once we got in there too, I think most of the breakfast had been eaten, and we were left with like these little crackers, but they were in the shape of toast. So I don't know Small if Small toasts that were <laughs> yeah. more fragile than wet tissue. I mean, these things... <laughs> If you looked at them, if you breathed on them wrong, they would have broken. Yeah. They were so... I remember trying to spread a little bit of butter on it, and it just crumbled in my hands. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> this is what I'm working with, so... Um, not yeah. the most substantial breakfast. No, we did not plan for that, and I remember... There were they... no cups for coffee. No, you drank them out... Well, I heard that this is why... They... This is how they do it. You drink out of bowls. Oh, that's just how they do it there? Yeah. Isn't that weird? So yeah, we there were these small little glass bowls. Look like a small cereal bowl or yogurt bowl. Yeah, and that's what you drank your uh, coffee out of, which was just an instant coffee. And 
So I had my instant coffee and my crumbly cracker, and we start seeing um, the pilgrims go over to the sink, and they're just cleaning up their dishes, which was nice, you know, but I don't know that they realized that the sink started overflowing, and it must have been clogged or something with the plumbing. And It was a big sink, too. It was a very big sink. And, and someone just left the water going, and yeah. it's overflowing from the counter into the middle of the floor. Yeah. And there is a freaking lake in the floor. <laughs> yeah. It's not even like a small drizzle. There, it, no. People are like almost jumping over this lake and they're still like you know turn the water off what are you doing yeah it was very silly so carl and i are just watching i think in disbelief of just like what the hell is happening here and i remember you started you found a mop and you started mopping up and trying to be nice and like helpful and clean because you don't want you know that nice older woman to come back to her albergue just flooded And then it got to a point where it just wasn't going anywhere. And I was like, you know what? We got to leave. I know it's, you know, not, not nice to leave it this way. Kids spent 30 minutes cleaning up the kitchen and then had this big day. We have to get out there. I felt bad, but. But you know what? There's only so much you can do. And you know, if she, if she's used to her pipes clogging, maybe she's used to a wet kitchen in the morning. I'm not sure. But yeah, so we had to get out of there at that point and. I remember walking out of town, it was, uh, I don't know if it was still dark, but it was pretty hazy, I think, an overcast day. It was misty, for sure. It was pretty yeah. misty, so. It was a lot of fog. Yeah, and. Which made a very mystical and magical feeling. It was, and I think kind of walking out of the little city center, or the town center, uh, when it starts to, you know, gradually incline up this mountain, I remember kind of looking down at the different pastures and there were cows over here and horses over here and just rolling green hills. And I, it literally, I felt like we were Sam and Bilbo leaving the Shire, (laughs) which was pretty cool. So, um, especially that it was end of May, it was just springtime as well. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I feel like that place is always green though, but it might've been extra green. I don't know. It was very magical and. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that kind of what we learn just getting out of town, you know, we go at very different paces. And me especially, I've always had kind of sports-induced asthma, so my breathing gets heavy. So I usually need to power through and then stop for a second and then power on and then stop and then power on and then stop. So... And Carl, I think, just likes to keep it slow and steady and keep going, you know, so I... I was feeling good, too. I was well-rested. I was excited. It was super pretty. The weather was nice. We were just starting this awesome thing. It was... I was ready to go. I was moving. Yeah. And so he was up the hill, and I'm like, oh, I need to keep, you know... And again, like I said, I was pretty out of shape, so I... I needed to take my time and go at my own pace, and luckily I found a gal who, whose pace was very similar to mine. And well, it's all uphill at first as well. It's all I mean, uphill. right out of the town. It is just up, up you go. It's within eight miles. You're increasing by I think it's forty three hundred feet. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. I just did the research, so. Um, it is quite the incline within the first eight miles and you get to Orison, which is, uh, I wouldn't even call it a town, but it's no. a little cafe that's surrounded by a few houses. As I was walking up to that cafe, I had met a gal from the UK. Her name's Gemma and she was leaving her, uh, job behind or I guess taking time off and, she was not sure if she wanted to keep working there because she said she wasn't super happy with it, but she was kind of doing this walk for that. And, um, yeah, we just kind of hit it off and I felt like I made my first Camino friend on the, you know, very first leg of it. So that was pretty cool. And once we got up to Orison, we caught up to Carl and we had a couple things to eat and, she bought us these things called shandies, which I had no idea what it was, but it's beer and lemonade. 
which was pretty tasty. So it's just to have a little, a nice pint, and then we actually had something to eat. Yeah. That was like, was a warm soup. Yeah. I think, and it was cool because of all the fog. So it was misty and a bit drizzly. So it's nice to have a warm meal and then yep. a pint on top of that. And yeah. And so I think that that was where she had booked one night stay. So we had to say bye to her. And we weren't sure if we were going to see her again. But it was, uh, yeah, it was cool meeting her. And so then we had to trudge on because we knew that we weren't even up the whole part of the mountain yet. We had still quite the hike ahead of us. Yeah, and then, we had a lot to go still. And then the whole descent to the backside into the town where we were going to stay the night, which was called Roncevalles. And, um, which was crossing the border into uh, Spain. Getting up to the peak, I had heard these bells, and uh, I think that at first, I had no idea what they were. I thought it was maybe uh, pigs or something, because the only thing that I can associate a little clanky bell that sounded like that were either cows or pigs. Sheep, too. Or, or sheep. And so I, I was like, oh, that's... And I couldn't see it. The fog was super thick. The fog did point. get really thick. And so I remember uh, getting closer and closer, and I, uh, I see that they're horses. So there are these huge, uh, what look like just wild horses, but they're not because they have the bells, but they're, it's totally open range. So they're just running on this free to roam. Yeah. Free to roam on this mountainside, which was pretty awesome. And, uh, I had stopped there just kind of looking at them. And this other guy that I had met was stopped there looking at them as well. And we just saw this, uh, mare nursing her uh colt or her baby horse and on top of a mountain <laughs> that was pretty magical so this guy omar and i had a moment just watching uh this like really beautiful scene in nature so that was pretty cool mm -hmm. and uh i think that before that even i was uh hiking up you know hiking up this hill and I see out of this mist this guy approaching me and I was thinking oh you know you're going the wrong way dude <laughs> and I was almost tempted to say it but I didn't um but he gets closer you know the shadow or what I could make of the person gets closer and closer to me I look at him and he's got this long white beard and mustache and he looked like he just walked off of Everest, man. Like, he looked like a mountaineer, which was pretty awesome. And that's the moment where I was like, oh, he's not walking the wrong way. You know, he's he's been hiking this for a while. And I was almost thinking, like, was this his last day? Like, did he start in St. John? Or where did he start? You know, people go for... from many different countries to Santiago. So it was pretty kind of a surreal moment. And it all kind of hit me of the significance of what I was doing or the gift of actually walking this Camino. Uh, it all hit me right at that moment where he passed and he said, Buen Camino. And that means basically a good way in Spanish. And it's what all of us pilgrims say to each other, just kind of wishing everybody to have a good, a good journey. And I said, Buen Camino back. And then I think he kept walking and I just started bawling. <laughs> I just started crying because it was super touching and magical. And it was a good moment to just kind of have a, a very happy tear cry and just very grateful for the moment that I had. So that was pretty pretty awesome but uh carl wasn't around so i wasn't sure where you were at at the time no i basically was always ahead but yeah every now and then i'd stop and wait and then we'd meet up and then because my pace was faster um eventually gain headway and be by myself ahead of the our little twosome pack at the moment so yeah it's just keeping my own pace yeah what were some things you were experiencing I was just really taking it in. It was just, I mean, the beauty of the countryside was, I mean, that and the, the mystic fog and 
how green everything was and the animals that were roaming around and just the solitude of everything. It was just, I was just taking everything in and absorbing everything. I had met a, um, an, Auss, an Aussie, an Australian guy named Rob. He was with a friend. Uh, I think Rob's pace was a bit quicker than his friend, so he was constantly waiting as well. So we kept crossing paths throughout most of the day, at least on the ascent up to the um, the peak. Uh, super nice guy. Was it just like you guys were crossing paths, or did you actually like stop and talk, or was it just kind of like a hey? Uh, you was, again, cause... For the most part, it was quick chit chat. Um, a lot of it was just, you know, I guess expressing how steep it all was and everything. Um, there was parts where we were walking alongside each other, but then his friend needed a break and I'd keep going or something, or, or I would wait for you and then they would keep going. Uh, so for the most part, it was just quick little conversations. But yeah, just expressing, I guess, one, the the challenge that, you know, of all the uphill. And uh, there was a bit of mud because it had been wet and drizzly. The layout of everything, I think they were really taking everything in too with um, just the scenery and the environment and everything with all the animals. And Yeah, I remember that there was that really long stretch of mud that was pretty... Uh pretty thick and that was that was a little difficult that was a little tricky to get to or get through but uh i remember we were at the same place i think at the same time when we were going through that which was nice because we kind of were there for each other as support almost walking through that yeah there i didn't i didn't jump ahead too far just because it was i mean with it being rocky and muddy it was a bit slick so just to be sure that we were you know making our way up this uh, bit of a tricky section. Yeah. All right, without, you know, going ahead to the point of you're out of sight. So. Yeah. Um, But, yeah, I think on the descent uh, we took, there was one really steep section that just came after uh, you get to, there's almost like, I want to say, it's not really a statue but it almost looks like a marker where there's a flag. And I think that there's um, an emergency phone up there in case you need it for whatever reason. Um, Some people, you know, get up there and there might be snow. Some people walk this year round. So really there could be any reason. They might have not been able to get to the top until too late to where yeah. they wouldn't have been able to get down in time yeah. and they're kind of stuck at the top yeah which is not where you want to be if it's like you're getting there by dusk or something or yeah. whatever you know? yeah yeah i mean it's not an easy hill <laughs> to cross it's a mountain and i think that um yeah certain i mean if you're not prepared you you can suffer the consequences people have died walking up this this trail so and along the whole entire Camino, you know, if you're just, uh, you know, if it's your time. <laughs> but uh, at that point, there is a really steep section, and you can either choose to go down that one. However, when we were there, that one was closed, so we had to take the fork in the, the other fork in the road, which goes along the road the entire way down to the town that we were going to stay the night in. And uh, that was, it was easier on the knees, which I think was what you were having a hard time with. I think at one point you had to walk backwards. Oh, it was harder on the knees. The -hmm. descent's harder on the knees for me than the ascent. Oh, no, I meant the the two routes. There's the steep one and then there's the road one. Because if you went down the steep one, that would have shot your knees out. Yeah, Completely. so, I mean, just the impact of going downhill with the weight of my pack, Yeah, uh, I was really rough on my knees, so, um, yeah, I was walking backwards, Yeah, just to take uh, a bit more impact yeah. off of them, because they were, they were hurting. And, I mean, we were, I think, back of the pack, pretty much, at this point it in felt time, like it. because we, again, we, we were packing for an entire year's worth of traveling so yeah, well most people were 
had just packed for the Camino, so yeah. So we for were, the most part, other people's packs are smaller, but yeah, we had some pretty full on packs. Yeah, so I think you were carrying what forty five pounds or something. Close yeah, I think to it was that. like forty five pounds, and I was carrying about thirty, mm-hmm. or if not a little bit more. But what they say you should pack is ten percent of your body weight. So literally, I was carrying, you know almost three times my body weight (laughs) or you know or not three times my body weight but almost 30 percent of my body weight so um yeah I was definitely carrying too much yeah wait god that's not even right my math is horrible but (laughs) I was carrying more than I needed for sure but yeah so we were hurting on the way down but we made it and once we got to Roncevallas, we checked into the albergue, and luckily they still had beds. I was beat. We were both pretty shot. Yeah. And we didn't even leave the albergue to get food. We just grabbed something out of their vending machines, I think. Yeah, we took our packs off very gladly. I took my shoes off, which I was very glad to do. Yeah. And then we showered. And after that, I felt okay, but I was still, I didn't even want to leave the albergue, which is basically an old monastery. Yeah, it was really cool, though. The facility was really nice. It was really nice. It was all redone and modern and new and clean, which was pretty awesome. Um, But yeah, as far as doing much, we didn't, we kind of just... I had went to the vending machine in hopes of finding something that was a bit more substantial than snacks yeah. or, you know, so all that I found was, uh, hot dogs, <laughs> no buns, what? just hot dogs. Just, I don't remember that. Yeah. That was so funny. I think I bought two packs of those. <laughs> I don't even remember how I heated them up. They might've been cold. I don't know. I just needed something in my stomach and I was ready to crash out. They had a kitchen there, though. They had a whole kitchen. No, I think I boiled them. Yeah. Yeah. So we had some boiled wieners. Boiled wieners. That was... (laughs) Yummy. Mm. (laughs) Um, Yeah, but I think that literally I was scared that I wasn't going to be able to continue on with how my body felt because it was pretty fucked (laughs) same my knees felt terrible yeah i remember we do have uh it's like a uh, almost like an icy hot but it's like an ayurvedic rub like muscle rub yeah so we (laughs) rubbed that pretty much on our whole bodies if i had a a bath of it i would have dunked myself in it but yeah so we were at least relaxing a little bit you know laying down writing in our journals if we could and then uh yeah getting ready for the next day and uh, literally it was just kind of one foot in front of the other on the next day. I kind of had to get over the pain that my body was in and it was almost like starting up an old car. Once you started, on a cold day. yeah, once you started walking, you started feeling better. But as soon as you stopped, you felt worse. A bit of a rusty start. Yeah. So... But this, I mean, this day was beautiful, and it was sunny as can be. Again, an early start. Early start. Which we're still getting used to. Yeah. And uh, I remember it was a lot of, uh, it wasn't as steep, you know. There, I don't think there were as many hills. There were a little bit of the declines uh, or descents that were kind of hurting my knees a little bit this day. I felt good again, ironically. I was uh, felt pretty strong, and I was surprised of how I recovered from my knees. But yeah. I was feeling definitely better, but... I think the sunshine helped as well. That's true. Because it was... Yeah. You know, the worst day was over, according to many people, and it was just sunny, and you started off at a moderate pace, and it was super pretty again, but... There was definitely no mountains to conquer this day, so. No, uh uh-uh. And it was nice because you're going through these small little farm towns, and uh, it was kind of cool seeing the farmers tend to their crops. And I remember we did get to a cafe at one point, and we were going to get something to eat for lunch, and or maybe a late breakfast. And 
uh, we get in there and I remember being able to order a sandwich in Spanish. And that for me felt like a relief because Spanish, I uh, had taken a little bit in high school. So uh, rather than French, I was able to communicate with the woman uh, behind the counter a bit more, which just felt like, you know, again, you're in a new country. So it was kind of cool too. You felt like you accomplished something. Like you felt, you know, comfortable being able to converse with the locals in their language to, you know, get yeah. something done or order something or yeah. ask for something. And I can order coffee and it's... a sandwich and ask where the bathroom is. <laughs> Rather than in France, I can't do shit. <laughs> There's a lot of hand yeah. waving in motion. Yeah, for sure. So it's just a feeling more, uh, being more comfortable with the language, which was nice. And uh, I think that we had ran into your friend Rob again. Yeah, Rob was at that cafe, so, you know, another quick hello and quick conversation. We were all outside on the patio just soaking up the sun. Little cats were roaming around. Yeah. <laughs> it was pretty cute. So yeah, most of the day there was a lot of just wooded areas you were walking through, a lot of shady uh, trail sections through pine trees and foresty bits. That... And then with the sun shining through on the trail and with the pine trees, there were lots of uh, nostalgic smells from where I grew up in Northern California. There's just smell very similar. Um, and there was like trickles and streams and with me just being where I was, I was just in a really good place. I was loving what I was doing. Um, yeah, I just felt really content. And uh, I remember sitting in this section, just eating some snacks that we had picked up from the cafe. And uh, Rob had passed with his friend. And he just said, oh, what about today? And or something, you know, isn't today great? Something like that. And it just felt really good, and I was just having the best day. It was really good, yeah. Yeah, it was. I loved the walk this day, and like he was saying, just couldn't have asked for better weather. Um, I do remember, however, uh, coming into a town. It was the name of the town was Suberi, and and uh, <clears throat> the descent into that town was on a lot of. Uh, like slate rock so like these big slabs of rock where it had a lot of loose rock on top of it and uh it did affect my knees quite a bit a lot more than i had anticipated so once we had made it into this town i was done i was totally done for and so i had uh i had called it quits and said carl i i need us to stop here because i can't go on and so we had uh, found our albergue and found a little cafe and, you know, grabbed some drinks and was just enjoying Sported the rest of the day. Yep, enjoying some food. And I think that uh, I went and dunked my feet in the river there because they had a river that it was just like ice You basically cold. cross a bridge yeah. over the river and that's when you get into Zubiri. Yeah. Yeah, so we were icing our feet in the river yeah which was nice because they basically it was so cold that your feet went completely numb so whereas these are the things that you're thinking of like every second of every day you didn't have to think about them for a second because i felt like they weren't there it felt good to it felt really good numb them up because they they were pounding yeah. yeah they were sore for sure and funny little factoid I guess of about Zubiri I don't know if you remember this from when we walked but when I walked it the second time the bridge there was called the bridge Rabaez and it's like the rabies bridge mm -hmm. and so they believed that any cattle or animal that they had back in the day that had rabies if they would walk around that center pillar of that bridge like three times or however many times that it would cure them of rabies <laughs> i was like that's weird that is weird yeah i remember hearing about that but i didn't remember the 
I just remember hearing that it was called the Rabies Bridge. Yeah. I was like, well, why is it called this? But I thought that was fun. Um, but yeah, I remember while we were sitting out on the patio of the cafe, we saw Liz and Christina walk by, which we were like, yay! We were you know? inside. Or, yeah, inside. That's right. But yeah, we saw Liz and Christina, our Santa Cruz friends, walk by. And we weren't expecting to bump into them again, so no, that we was... we didn't know that we passed them, because they left the day before we started. Yeah, so they had stayed in Orison, I think, mm -hmm. and then they had met a another couple from Australia, and their names were Brett and Jen, and they were just a riot. We clicked with them right at the get-go. Had sangria and had a really pleasant afternoon, just hanging out and telling stories. And they had been, you know, traveling for quite a while and had a lot of experience with just life on the road, traveling as a couple, and been to lots of places. So, yeah, we clicked right out, of, right out the gates. Yeah, a lot of common ground. Yeah, and I think that the sangria pitchers. Uh, you know, several of them deep. We wanted to continue the good times, and so we headed back to our albergue, which was the same one that Brett and Jen uh, were staying at. And so we ended up staying up with Brett for most of the night. I think Jen went to sleep, but yeah. we uh, were chatting with Brett about travel for a good portion of the night. Yeah, we were pretty late. Having a good time. Yeah. Um, but I remember in this albergue specifically... Uh, where it was one of the loudest snorers I have ever heard in my life and still to this day. Ever. And even after having walked a f couple other Caminos after this one, still the loudest snorer. I had my earbuds in with music playing quite loudly at this point in time because I had to just keep turning it up because I kept hearing her. And even on the loudest mm. setting, she was still getting through i could it was a guy that was a big guy no it was his wife <laughs> remember no, it yes it was we found it out the next day because i think that i had looked at the bed that it was coming from and i was like holy shit yeah it's her mm. but yeah it was it was the loudest snoring i had ever heard and have ever heard i don't still. know how someone's throat was still intact yeah. after yeah it was crazy but yeah so the next day um or I think that night before we had, you know, gone back to our albergue, we all kind of decided that we would meet up the next morning. And that we would all walk out the next morning. We and... would all walk together the next day into Pamplona, which was going to be the first major city on the Camino that we were going to get to. And the end of the third day or third stage, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so we got up and we had some breakfast and they had a pretty decent breakfast at this albergue and mm -hmm. we ate with Brett and Jen and then we went out looking for Liz and Christina and we met up with them and started on our way. I, this was one of my favorite walks, I think, out of Zubiri. Um, it was lush, green, um, going through cute little quaint towns villages little villages there's there, a stream that alongside you a lot of the day there were animals left and right i had a moment with a horse at one point even though i feel like he probably has moments with all the pilgrims that he walks or that walk by him um but yeah it was it was pretty awesome pretty special day and i remember uh you know, we all kind of kept our own pace, but for a good portion of the day, we were all together. We stuck together as a team for the most part. Yeah, yeah. and so I think that there was uh, one point where we had stopped off by a river, and we had uh, just kind of been taking some photos and just kind of taking in the scenery, uh, getting a little bite to eat. And I remember Brett jumped in the water, which was pretty hilarious because it looked freezing. I think there were a few other pilgrims that you would see a couple times, and it was almost just like you became more familiar with the people that were walking. I remember mm -hmm. there was an older woman who would keep crossing our paths. I think she was from Germany. Yeah. And then there was, uh, yeah, just a few other people that you recognize. You don't necessarily stop and say hello because you're walking and doing your thing, but you start recognizing people a little bit more. 
Yeah, I think that we had ran into uh, Omar again. Yeah, at he one had point. teamed up with us again. Yeah. And I think that there was one section that we were walking down that was pretty steep, and I know that Jen was having issues with her knees, which uh, everybody kind of chimed in. I don't know who started it. I think it was probably Brett that started singing, I Will Survive. <laughs> and so everybody started singing, I Will Survive, to help Jen get down this hill. To motivate her to make it down, because I can sympathize with those knee pains. They're no joke. Oh, same with me. I was having them the day before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was pretty cool, though, that we were all able to kind of band together, and we were like this little team. And then uh, eventually, because uh, we were taking so many stops that, you know, it was getting later in the day, and it was getting so hot. I think towards the end of it, it was um, just you, me, and Omar that kept going while Brett and Jen and Liz and Christina kind of hung back, and they were taking another break. With the pack on and waiting, it takes a toll on your feet. And I just wanted, at this point, I was getting close to calling it a day. And we still had like six kilometers to get into Pamplona, yeah. which a lot of it was along the road at this point. Yeah, it was brutal. And My it, feet were killing me. Yeah, I mean, we were trying to walk on any little grassy patch just to get off the cement sidewalk Yeah, that we could. It was crazy. But I remember once we, like, saw that we were getting into Pamplona, like, we had made it, oh, thank God. Uh, we had walked a little ways after this bridge, and we saw the first albergue that said, you know, <laughs> I think it was Paderborn, or Casa Paderborn albergue, and we're like, okay, we're here. <laughs> we were just like, I'm done, get my shoes yeah. off my feet, I'm ready to check in, like, get me here. And so uh, Omar had kept going, and I think that he wanted, he knew of this one albergue he wanted to stay in in the middle of town, and we were like, no, nope, sorry, I we'll did, see you later. I wanted to go no further. <laughs> yeah, we were at our at our end, so. But uh, I remember this place was uh, a little odd, just from the get-go. The hospitalero, or the owner of the albergue, pop his head out, and he said, okay, I'll just be with you guys in just a minute, and that's when we had said bye to Omar, and so then we're just waiting for him to see us, and he takes us back inside, and his wife was really nice, and said, come with me, you know. We're ready to check you in. Yep, yeah, we'll, um... We'll take you over here in his office, and they offered us juice and crackers, and they seemed very prim and proper. His name, he introduced himself as Herman. Mr. Herman. And his wife's name was Gertrude. And so, just right off the bat, we knew that they were German. And they were very excited that Carl's name started with a K. <laughs> very excited. They asked me how what our names were when they were checking us in and getting our info and, you know, asking for the Pilgrim's passports and they asked me how I spelled my name. I said it's with a K and they were like, oh, German? <laughs> Very excited. Yeah, they as were. I confirmed it was from German roots. And, uh, yeah, so they were kind of just giving us the lowdown of what the rules were in the albergue and... They had some very strict rules, and one of them was that they had a, a very strict curfew of 9 o'clock, and that we Which were... seemed very early. Very early. And they this, pretty much explained if you weren't back by 9 o'clock, you were going to be locked out. Yeah. And this being the first big city that we've been to... We didn't really feel like we wanted to be in at 9. We were like, it's still light outside at 9 o'clock. Why do we have to... It felt, yeah, I don't know, like you were back in third grade and you had a curfew at home or something. Yeah. Um, they also had asked if we were married, and we said no, to which they seemed slightly disappointed, or... Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, they had a disappointed look, like, oh, well... It was weird. Yeah. So, yeah, right off the bat, we're kind of just getting this vibe of, this is awkward feeling. And, uh... Bit of a judgmental couple. Yeah. Is what it felt like. Yeah, that's how it felt. Very judgmental. So, 
Um, they continue to explain their rules and procedures. Yeah. Which then led to the morning and breakfast, which made it even weirder with how they explained it. Yeah. He basically said that at 6 o'clock, you get up, you come down, you eat, you smile. And we were like, <laughs> what is happening? Who are these people? <laughs> we were like, don't tell me when to smile. <laughs> what is this? Weird fairy tale utopia. I don't know. It, yeah, very uh, just odd. Very, it felt very controlling. Like who requests? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And whenever I feel controlled, I feel like rebelling. So this is kind this was of ridiculous requests yeah. like that. Yeah, it was pretty hilarious. But yeah, so we we ended up going. We we found our room, our dorm room that had several other bunks in it, and we go to try to find our beds and lay out our sleeping bags, and I think that there was another uh, couple people in there, and one of them that was underneath Carl's bunk, we both got a top bunk, Um, there was a gal, a German gal underneath Carl, and then across from her was this Italian guy, And (laughs) I guess they had paired up as not like a romantic thing, but just Just as a Camino as a Camino team team walking together. And it was hilarious to me because the German gal knew a little bit of English, English, so she could talk to us (laughs) like I don't know English. (laughs) <laughs> right now. <laughs> um, but yeah, so she knew a little bit of English, and she was telling us, you know, about them being paired up, and I remember very vividly her laugh and how <laughs> funny it was that anything he would try to say to her, she had no idea what he was saying, because it was all in Italian, and she could only communicate with him through hand gestures and him with her the same. So they were a very odd pair. But I just remember her being super she funny. She was just getting a kick out of explaining this weird dynamic between the two of them. Yeah. And the language barrier of him only speaking Italian and her only speaking German. Yet they paired up and were trying to communicate with each other. And he would talk to her as if she knew what he was saying. Totally. And she would just crack up in this deep... Booming laugh. Yeah, just a booming laugh. Almost (laughs) as if you just imagine this big German baker lady or something. (laughs) And she would just... (laughs) It was hilarious. It was so good. I loved it. But she was just like, <laughs> whenever he would say something to her. He would in, just rattle something off, like, you know, Italian. not slowly. Yeah. And he would just. And then she she would, like, look over at him and look really mm. confused. And then she'd look over at us and be like. <laughs> just this big booming laugh and like, I don't know what the hell he's saying. I was and like, that is hilarious. It was just a riot. <laughs> it was so good. Um, but, yeah, anyway, so we. We were there for a little... checked in and took a shower, changed, all that. Yeah, and then we hear Brett and Jen walk in. And so we're like, oh, yes, they made it. We were glad that they stopped at our hostel. Yeah, so they were pretty much in the same boat that we were just ready to pick whichever albergue was available. Yeah, and we had a feeling, too, because of the condition that Jen was in, that they were going to pick the first albergue as well. Yeah, so... Um, But, yeah, we uh, kind of reconvene there and then we wanted to go out and hit out the city or hit up the city uh i guess pamplona being the city where uh ernest hemingway used to frequent we went to his spot where it's in the main square there in town and excuse me (laughs) um it's called cafe irunia and so we had met uh, them, uh, one other person I think that we were walking with for a while, uh, his name was Josh. Yeah, Josh was from Alaska. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Christina and, Maine? and Liz. Maine, I think. I don't know. I don't know. Um, yeah, but, then Liz and Christina were there too. Yeah, so we all had a bunch of 
They all had a bunch of tapas and some beers and just a really good time just hanging together at that. Cafe. It was a nice cafe too. They had like really nice chandeliers and nice tables and we picked this big table so it could accommodate everyone. Yeah. And they basically had this like a glass cover that bordered the wall that had all these tapas in it and you could just kind of point at whatever ones you wanted and how many and then they'd bring this whole plate to you and so we had a bunch of wine and basically stuffed ourselves with these tapas or like these little finger food appetizer things that were so good. Yeah, it was, it was awesome. And then I think that, uh, both Liz and Christina had to walk the next day. So we had said that we could meet them for breakfast and then just say bye to them because we were going to be staying another day with Brett and Jen hanging with them and just resting. So I think that um, once we were done at Cafe Arunia, we maybe headed up to another area of the streets and just kind of checking out shops. And I remember it was It getting... looked really cool. And I kept looking at my <clears throat> iPod for the time and just being, like, you know, just being afraid of being locked out because these strict, weird German <laughs> hospital arrows that were running the place were going to lock us out if we didn't show up in time. <laughs> Yeah, so we uh, basically had to hightail it to our albergue. So we didn't everything get... was just starting to pop off. Like people were starting to go out for the night. Oh and, yeah, you know the bars were starting to open and places. You know, like the night, the night crowd was starting to get lively and yeah. And they were they had a countdown to their uh, San Fermin. San also Fermin. the Running with the Bulls. Yeah, so the Running with the Bulls festival once a year, they were counting down. So it was getting pretty lively, and we were like, "This is the last thing that we want to do is go right back to our albergue." And but... we had to go home to go to bed. <laughs> is what it felt like. You our know? parents told us to be in, but yeah. So I think that Brett and Carl both bought each a bottle of wine. On the way back, like right before we had to be back. Because it was, no, it was like 8 o'clock. We still had like an hour and we wanted to get back in time to drink it. Yeah, that's right. So we made it back and I went inside and asked Herman the German for some glasses for the wine. And he looked pretty disappointed and very unapproving, but <laughs> almost reluctantly handed me two glasses, which there were four of us, but... I felt lucky enough to just get two and wanted to leave the situation due to his, you know, judgmental, I don't know about this. His lack of approval. So, like, All right, well, we're... so we went outside and down these steps near this river where they had this little seating area and basically we're just spinning the wine bottles back and forth, just yeah. passing them around. And yeah, we just wanted to enjoy the night, the rest of the night and... We decided to get a little bit of a buzz on before we go back so we could sleep soundly in our bunks of, you know, however many people were in our room. And I remember we felt like we were kids sneaking, you know, booze. I don't know. It felt very like, oh, be careful. So we, He's going to bust us. We were down there for maybe 20 minutes. Yeah. And then Herman pops his head around the corner and goes, it's time to come in, you know, like. <laughs> Well, cause eight, we still have 20 minutes. It was like 8.40. Yeah. We had at least 15 minutes. Yeah. But. And we thought even 9 o'clock was early. Usually it's like 10, but, you know, whatever. I can respect if you have rules, but at yeah. least stick with them. Yeah. You know? Don't. If we still have 20 minutes, give us a 20 minutes. Yeah. So we... I think they were ready to go to bed was the problem. And yeah. They wanted us in so they could lock up. Yeah. So we uh, we went in, and I think that we had gone into Brett and Jen's room. They had gotten one that only had two bunks in each uh, in that their room. So and us were... having snuck in the bottle of wine in our coats, <laughs> yeah. so they would you they know... wouldn't see. Yeah. And we get into their room, and there were two Spanish ladies. They were from uh, Valencia, and they were really nice and loved talking with us and they were telling us all about where they are from and we were telling them future travel plans and so we were hitting it off with them and just having a good old chat and sharing our wine with them and we were yeah and we didn't feel like we were being too loud but you know all of a sudden the door 
barges open and it's Herman with it's Gert. Herman and Gertrude and Herman is borderline running in the room. Yeah. But Gertrude is like semi holding him back and he is pissed. His face is bright red. He is bright red. They're both in their PJs. <laughs> and he is like, What is going on? You give me the bottle. Give me the glasses. Yeah. And me and Brett were like, <laughs> fuck this dude. <laughs> and so we both looked at each other and just <clears throat> tilted our bottles back and finished the bottle. <laughs> He's like, you get back to your rooms. This is unacceptable. <laughs> we're like, oh he my was... God. We just got busted by the parents. <laughs> I, I had a hard time not laughing, but I was like, oh my God, we're in trouble. I went yeah. right back to that kid like you know, feeling of, oh, shit, we did something bad. We were like, it's at this point maybe like quarter after nine. Yeah. And we're just, no one's having so a problem late. in here. We're not. No. And like we, like I said, we weren't being disrespectful. We weren't like yelling or anything. We weren't but, breaking yeah. glasses against the wall. You know, it's just we're hanging out, enjoying each other's company. The two other t Spanish gals in there were enjoying the conversation. And yeah. So anyways, we uh, head off to our rooms, and we fall asleep, and uh, they, that was the end of the they night. do the same, the same, and that was, yeah, the end of the night, and and uh, we get woken up at, was it 6 o'clock? I thought it was like 5.30. Oh my god, it was early as shit. It was and dark. It wasn't... It was abrupt. <laughs> it was very abrupt. And so apparently Herman and Gertrude had installed a speaker system all throughout their house. Of which is mostly wood. The yeah. stairs and everything were wood. So, I mean, it doesn't have to be a big speaker because it just it echoes, echoes throughout the entire mm. house. And so I felt like there was a speaker right above my head with how loud... This music came on. I swear it was because of us that it oh, was extra I, loud. <laughs> probably. They just wanted to torture us. But I woke up abruptly. I think I sat straight up in my bed. And it was the loudest. It wasn't like gospel, but it was... It was like opera. Opera, like angelic. Of course, it probably would have been more angelic at a lower volume. But like Christian music, very, very religious, <laughs> uh, churchy, you know, we are heavenly saints and you are the demons. Get out of our house. <laughs> like they were trying to exercise to us. To audibly smudge the demons that were us out of their <laughs> Out of their day. home. Yeah. So we didn't even bother going down to breakfast because we're like, screw this, we're out of here. I didn't even want to confront them at all. No, I didn't. I even just want to wanted see to him. get the hell out. Yeah. And I remember waking up and going to the bathroom, and it's still just booming it's, through the whole house. I thought it was going to stop after one song, but it kept going. And then passing Jen in the hallway, and she was like, <laughs> she walked. Did up. I die? Am I in heaven? What is this? <laughs> I it saw, I remember so... her expression to this day. I saw her walking up the stairs and I think the music's still going and she's like, have I died and gone to heaven? Because <laughs> it really did feel like it was hilarious. The, the soundtrack to, you know, what <laughs> people would feel heaven's music was. Oh, but it was hilarious. And yeah, so they had gone down to dinner and, or to breakfast, <laughs> you know. And I they, think she did. I don't think Brett did. I think Brett stayed in bed. I don't remember. But and she, she had come up and told us how awkward it was. Said it was weird as shit. So I am kind of glad that we didn't go down to breakfast. And I remember that Brett and Jen were in their rooms packing up their bags, and they said that Herman came in and started looking at his watch. And just watching them. He would it, raise his arm up with his wrist, look at his wrist where his watch was, and then look at them, and then back at his watch. Yeah. You know, like, it's Get time the hell for you out. to leave. And <clears throat> it was literally, you still had like half an hour or 20 minutes left before we were told to get out. So, that was pretty crazy. Yeah, checkout was 8 o'clock, and this was at like 7.20. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <clears throat> yeah, so... Pretty crazy, but that was... We were glad to leave. The Herman the German story. 
Um, but yeah, so we had kind of uh, wanted another night there, so we all went out. In Pamplona. Out. Yeah. Not that hot. No, good God, no. We would not want to stay another night in Herman's place. So we wanted to find another place in Pamplona. So we went and we booked a night at the Hemingway Hostel, which was actually pretty cool. And mm -hmm. they had a nice little common room area where we spent most of the day kind of just chilling and relaxing and... So, yeah, we had met up with Liz and Christina for breakfast, and we wanted to say bye to them because they had to continue walking that day, and they were a little bit more crunched for time. So we, They basically uh, had their whole Camino planned out to where they were going to be walking every day. They were going to be staying mm -hmm. in hotels. Yeah. So they didn't have room for any zero days, so they had to keep going while we had our down day or zero day. Yeah. Uh, in Pamplona. So, yeah, we just got together and had a quick bite and coffee and mm -hmm. said our goodbyes and they went on their way. Yeah. Mm. We had followed them for the rest of the travels just as far as uh, seeing yeah, Facebook. And, yeah, Facebook and kind of watching them complete the Camino, but we never ran into them again because they were so crunched for time. But it was awesome meeting them and we still keep in touch to this day. So yeah. That's pretty awesome. Um, but yeah, as far as, I guess, this next day, we just kind of hung out in the hostel. I think we went out to get some food with Brett and checked out a local market, which was really cool, and just a lot of fresh food, a lot of seafood. Yeah. Um, a lot of produce, and so then we had met this gal from Canada. Her name was Becca, and another gal, uh, Mary, from Germany, and, uh, we just went out on the town that night, and... Ended up having a good old time and uh, getting a little bit drunk, but... You got to actually experience the nightlife a bit without having a curfew of 8 o'clock. So. Yeah, we could be out till whatever hour we wanted to be. So we took advantage and definitely stayed out. Yeah. There was one uh, Spanish gentleman we ran into. His name was Antonio. He came up to us. <laughs> we were basically outside of a bar with a table outside, and yeah. he just stumbled up on our table and started we started like singing and stuff oh and yeah he had his arms fully around both you and i and was belting out whatever tune he was just as loud as can be and uh yeah serenading us <laughs> it was awkward that's it was very awkward to the point of where they're talking to you in spanish and you're not getting what they're saying no but they're still talking to you like you're understanding them. But then once they stop and they're waiting for a response, yeah. and you're like, I, I didn't know Entiendo, sir. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, that was that was quite the night. He did go over and try to serenade Jen as well, and her, her look was priceless. Just very, <laughs> very bizarre moment. But uh, yeah, I think that we kind of had... Made our way down their little stretch of pubs there and ended up back at our hostel or our uh, alberg. I guess it wasn't an alberg, it was No, a this hostel. was a legit hostel with yeah. other travelers. No, I don't think, I think we were the only other pilgrims. Yeah. I think other people were just travelers and. Yeah. Which makes it, uh, I mean, if you're on the Camino and you do want a down day and you want to be able to, you know, stay out late probably a good idea to just check into a hostel rather than another albergue even if though it's an option yeah. yeah even though the albergues are a lot cheaper you know because they are for the pilgrims specifically you're gonna have curfews like we had or Certain you're gonna rules. have people that are falling asleep you know a lot earlier because they have to hike the next day you can only stay one night typically because yeah. it's basically for the one night until you get going the next day and yeah so they're really kind of ready for you to get out, kind of like Herman and Gertrude were. <laughs> Not that bad. But no, they're never that bad. This was just a rare occurrence. But yeah, so I think that um, once we got up that morning, we were all kind of nursing hangovers because we did get a little wild that night and uh, said our goodbye to Brett and Jen. And we... we had planned on possibly meeting in Europe at some point later on. Uh, just even if we, cause we had plans of going to Australia as well as maybe stopping by their place. Yeah. But that wouldn't be for another A good long while. Yeah. Maybe six months, seven, eight months. But they were still going to be traveling all over Europe. Um, cause this was their last or yesterday, the, the day that we, uh, 
had walked was their last walking day on the Camino. So they were planning on taking off and probably, I think, heading down to Portugal for like a music festival. And so they were also, uh, I think they were traveling in a, in a motor home. I don't think they'd got it yet. They had. I think they had left oh, they had parked it, yeah. it somewhere, huh? Yeah. So they had they had to go back and get their motor home, and then they were going to keep traveling around Europe. And I think that we were just kind of going to follow them on their travels through, you know, social media and see if we weren't going to be somewhere where they were going to be and end up being able to meet up with them again. Uh, so, yeah, because we liked Brett and Jen. They're our good Aussie friends. Um, but, yeah, I think that that was the... It was the first three days of the Camino, getting from St. John to Pamplona. Yeah, so, it was quite the experience. and Quite the intro to <laughs> yeah. Spain and the Camino life. Mm-hmm, yeah. And there's a lot more to come. With Next time. The Camino. If you liked what you heard, subscribe to our podcast. If you feel inclined, leave us a comment or review. Tell someone you know who might enjoy to have a listen, and feel free to share on your choice of social media. If you want to know more about us or see any photos of our travels, you can check out our website at trailofbeans.com. We also have a Facebook page where you can follow us on our upcoming adventures and get updates along the way, which can be found by searching at symbol The Bean Trail. We'll be back next week. Same beans? Same pod.